Hello and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. Today I'll be doing another practice retrosynthesis video, and we'll be focusing on the synthesis and reactions of alkenes, molecules with carbon-carbon double bonds. As always, I have an easy, medium, and more difficult reaction sequence, and the timestamps for those will be in the video description. If you'd like some review on the reactions or synthesis of alkenes, please go ahead and subscribe, and also take a look at my videos on that. Let's get right into the easy reaction here. This will be the synthesis of acetone, and that is our simplest ketone, from this substituted alkene, propene. As always, with our retrosynthetic analyses, we can count the number of carbons that we have in our starting material and final product. So we can see that we have three carbons in each compound, and so that doesn't change, which means we don't have to add or subtract any carbons. We have added oxygen in the product, so we have this carbonyl oxygen here. So we could maybe think of doing a hydration reaction on the alkene. And we also have that carbon-oxygen double bond. So we'll have to form a CO double bond at some point in our reaction sequence. For this retrosynthesis, let's start with the starting material, propene. We know that we need to add this oxygen atom to the middle carbon, the number 2 carbon here. So what reactions do we know that add an oxygen to a double bond? Well, we know of a couple different hydration reactions. And we could conceivably get two different products, depending on where we want that oxygen. So we could get this product, where we have the OH group added to the middle carbon here, so that's probably closer to our final product. And remember, this is called the Markovnikov addition, we've added to the more substituted carbon. Using different reaction conditions, we could also add to the other carbon. So we could get this N-propanol, with the hydroxyl group on the one carbon, and that would be our anti-Markovnikov product, with the hydroxyl group on the less substituted carbon. Like I've said, we probably want to go with the Markovnikov product. So a couple different ways to get that product would be just taking water in dilute sulfuric acid. That would be our acid-catalyzed hydration of this double bond. You could also use oxymercuration demercuration. So that would be using mercury acetate in water and following up with maybe sodium borohydride as a reductive workup. So that will give us the Markovnikov alcohol isopropyl alcohol. Then we can probably see to form this carbon-oxygen double bond, we need to oxidize this alcohol to a ketone. And to accomplish that, we could probably use PCC, and that's pyridinium chlorochromate, in dichloromethane as a solvent. You could also use the Jones oxidation conditions, that's dichromate in sulfuric acid and water. And that will give us the final product, acetone. Let's move on to the medium or intermediate difficulty retrosynthesis. That'll be the production of this tetrasubstituted alkene, this is 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene, from this other alkene, so this is 3-methyl-1-butene. And remember, I give you the nomenclature for these compounds just to get you acquainted and familiarized with the nomenclature, not necessarily for you to memorize that nomenclature, because it can be quite cumbersome with larger molecules. Let's do our preliminary inspections again of our starting material and product. We notice that we've added one carbon to that double bond, so we start with a 5-carbon molecule and end up with 6 carbons, which means that we'll probably have to utilize a Guignard reagent at some point, because that is our very useful reaction for forming carbon-carbon bonds. We can also notice that we have broken this double bond in the starting material, but then we've reformed another double bond in the product. So formation of a new double bond probably signifies an elimination reaction, so whether that's E2 or E1, we can see, but we'll probably be looking out for that. For this retrosynthesis, I think it is most useful to start from the product. So let's look at our tetrasubstituted alkene here. And we know that we need to perform an elimination to form that final double bond. So an elimination will require some sort of leaving group. So we could imagine this compound here, where we no longer have this double bond, but now we have some leaving group X on this carbon atom here. And we could eliminate that to form our double bond. Before we decide exactly which reagents we're going to use to perform that elimination, let's think about what we want our leaving group to actually be. So I've written X here, but leaving groups could be a number of things. We could have a halide, so I could have this tertiary alkyl bromide here, if we assume X is a halogen. 
we could maybe have a tertiary alcohol where we have x equal to OH. And now we have to decide between these two for our intermediate. We know that we have yet to form this carbon-carbon bond to add that extra carbon atom to our molecule, and that carbon-carbon bond formation is probably going to be realized through a Grignard reaction, and we know that the products of Grignard reactions are going to be alcohols. So let's look at this alcohol and see how we can synthesize that. If we're planning to do a Grignard reaction, we know that we have to start with a carbonyl, so a carbon-oxygen double bond. So if we take this compound here, where we have a ketone and only five carbons in this molecule, and we treat it with methyl magnesium bromide, so that's our Grignard reagent, in diethyl ether as a solvent, and then follow it up with an aqueous acidic workup. That will accomplish two things that we need for our retrosynthesis. So it will convert that carbonyl to an alcohol, which could act as our leaving group, and it also adds that methyl group that we need to add the extra carbon to our starting material. So that is fantastic. Now that we know how to get to our tertiary alcohol intermediate, we can fill in the reagents to accomplish this elimination reaction. So what we can do is treat this alcohol with concentrated hot sulfuric acid, and that will dehydrate the alcohol to form the alkene. And remember, this will be the more substituted, more thermodynamically stable alkene, which gives us the final product. So now we've arrived at this ketone intermediate, which is starting to look a lot more like our starting material. Let's try taking our starting material and sort of arrive at the ketone in the middle, so we can approach the ketone from both sides. We've already done the latter half of the synthesis. Let's work on the starting material. So if we look at this alkene here, we need to add an oxygen atom to this left-hand carbon. So if we could find a way to get this alcohol product, where we have the OH group on the left-hand carbon, that would be fantastic. And remember, this will be called the Markovnikov product because the OH group has been added to the more substituted carbon of the alkene. We know a few different methods to hydrate an alkene. So if we use just a very simple water and dilute sulfuric acid, we will actually get a carbocation rearrangement, and we're going to end up with this tertiary alcohol instead of the secondary alcohol we're looking for. Remember, because the acid-catalyzed hydration results in a carbocation intermediate, those carbocations are able to rearrange to form more stable ones. In order to avoid that carbocation, we can use oxymercuration demercuration. So that's going to be a two-step process. First, we use mercury-2 acetate in water, and then we follow up with a reductive workup, maybe using sodium borohydride. And that will give us the secondary, the Markovnikov alcohol, without any carbocation rearrangements, which is great. Finally, to convert this alcohol to the ketone, that's very straightforward. We can just use pyridinium chlorochromate in dichloromethane. You could also use a Jones oxidation for this. That would be sodium or potassium dichromate in sulfuric acid and water, and that would accomplish the same thing to give us this ketone here. So with that, we finish up the intermediate retrosynthesis by kind of approaching it from both sides, from the product and from the reactant. Finally, let's look at the more difficult or hard retrosynthesis problem I have here. This will be the synthesis of 3-methyl oxacycloheptane, this is the cyclic ether, from 1-methyl cyclohexene, and that's our starting alkene. We can notice, interestingly, that we have the same number of carbons in our starting material and product, so we haven't changed that. However, we do have a ring enlargement, so we start with a 6-membered ring and end up with a 7-membered ring. So somehow we're going to have to break that first 6-membered ring and then reform a 7-membered ring in the end. We also have a cyclic ether, like I said, so we could maybe form that from an ether condensation from two alcohols. And we've also added oxygen. So our starting material is just a simple alkene, and that means we'll have to hydrate that alkene or oxidize it somehow to get that oxygen atom in our product. With this retrosynthesis, I'd like to start from the product, so going backwards. So if we look at our big cyclic ether here, I mentioned that we could probably form that from an ether condensation, so using two alcohols and condensing them to form this cyclic ether. 
So if we take maybe this acyclic alcohol here, where we have two hydroxyl groups on either side of the chain, and then we have this methyl group, and we treat it with some dilute sulfuric acid, we can get those two alcohol groups to condense, releasing water in the process, and then closing the ring to form this cyclic ether. And that will also give us the methyl group in the position that we want. To figure out the next step, we'll need a little bit of creative thinking here. So we know that we have an acyclic material right now, this diol. However, we start with a cyclic alkene, so we have this cyclohexene. Now, one reaction that we can use to open up that alkene is ozonolysis. So the ozonolysis reaction will cleave that carbon-carbon double bond and give us an acyclic compound with two carbonyl groups. So keeping that in mind, that we're going to need some compound with two carbonyl groups eventually, we can imagine this other compound here, where all we've done is converted these two OH groups into carbonyl groups, so into aldehydes. And we know that using sodium borohydride in maybe methanol as a solvent, will reduce these aldehydes to the corresponding alcohol groups. Now we have that two carbonyl group product that we know is going to result from ozonolysis. So if we think backwards and perform our ozonolysis to get this carbonyl product, our starting material will look like this, where we still have a cyclohexene ring, but actually the double bond, if we count the number of carbons and where that methyl group is arranged, the double bond will be on this position instead of next to the methyl group like we have in the starting material. And this ozonolysis we can achieve using first ozone in methanol and following up with a reductive workup using dimethyl sulfide. And bonus points to make your retrosynthesis a lot more efficient, we can actually accomplish these two steps in just one step, taking this cyclohexene, first treating with ozone and methanol, and then instead of reducing it with dimethyl sulfide, which is a relatively mild reducing agent, we could just go ahead and use our sodium borohydride to reduce the ozonide intermediate straight down to the alcohol. Now we have this cyclohexene that is slightly different from our starting material, so we have the double bond in a different spot on the ring. We know a good way to form carbon-carbon double bonds is through an elimination reaction. So if we think of this starting material, where we have still the ring intact, but we've replaced this double bond with some sort of leaving group on this carbon, so I can just write X to represent any generic leaving group, we could do an elimination reaction to form that double bond. However, we have to think about the regioselectivity of our elimination reaction. So what that means is if I use a non-sterically hindered base, like sodium hydroxide or maybe sodium methoxide, we will get what's called the Zaitsev product. That will be the more thermodynamically stable product, where the alkene is more substituted. However, that just gets us back to our starting material and not to the alkene that we want. So what we have to use is a more sterically hindered base, like potassium t-butoxide, and we can do that in terpyl alcohol, to give us the Hoffman product, and that is going to be the less substituted alkene, which is the kinetically favored product. Okay, so finally, how do we convert our starting material, with the double bond between these two carbons, to this compound with a suitable leaving group? Well, we know a really good leaving group is a halogen, like bromine, so we could imagine this is now a secondary alkyl halide, where X is just equal to Br. And we know a few different methods to halogenate alkenes, but this product is interesting because we've added the bromine to the less substituted carbon of the alkene, instead of the more substituted one. So this is what is anti-Markovnikov addition of that bromine. And if you remember, the reaction we can use to brominate an alkene in an anti-Markovnikov fashion is radical bromination. So we'll accomplish that using hydrobromic acid, as well as some sort of peroxide. So I can just write R-O-O-R here to signify that we have that oxygen-oxygen single bond. And remember, proceeding through that radical mechanism, gives us the anti-Markovnikov product instead of the Markovnikov product that we would usually expect from other halogenation reactions. So that wraps up this practice video on retrosynthesis using alkenes and reactions of alkenes. If you like this video or learn something, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel, like my page on Facebook, and take a look at my website on the screen.
If you are able to, consider donating to my Patreon page, which really helps me to continue creating all these types of videos for all of you. Thanks for watching. Thank you.